David Rice and Edward Poindexter are still in jail. In Nebraska, there is no parole in life sentences. Dwayne Peake, who testified against them, spent four years in youth custody and was released in 1974. He then disappeared. However, 20 years on, new evidence has emerged. At the trial, Dwayne Peake testified he telephoned the police on Ed Poindexter's instructions. Members of his family now maintain it was not Dwayne who called the police. All emergency calls are recorded as a matter of course. But in the early 1970s, the Omaha police claimed the only tape recording of Dwayne Peake's call had been destroyed. But in fact, the operator on duty on the night of the bombing made his own copy of the call. When he died recently, this tape turned up in Omaha. This tape was played to people who remembered Dwayne's voice. Now, I had listened to Dwayne Christopher Peake testify for almost three days before the jury. I had taken two sets of depositions. I had sat with this young man for hours listening to him describe uh, his actions, his contentions, his recollections, and heard his voice and was saturated with his voice. It is my opinion now that the voice on that tape was not Dwayne Christopher Peake. When I heard this tape and realized that the deep voice of a much older man that I heard on this tape was the one they were saying was the voice of Dwayne Peake, this 15-year-old kid whose voice I knew, I couldn't believe it. Anybody who heard that tape would have to know that the whole story about Dwayne Peake having made a phone call to lure the police to that house would have known it was a lie. And for officials of the law enforcement branch to do something like that is reprehensible and inexcusable and the fact that they did that made it clear to all of us that they knew David and Ed were innocent. If the voice on the tape is not Dwayne Peaks, it's clear he was lying on oath. These newly obtained documents show the FBI was well aware of this perjury. The Omaha police and the FBI deliberately arranged for the tape recording to be suppressed because, in their words, it would be prejudicial to the case against Rice and Poindexter. In other words, they knew Peake was lying. Uh, we feel we got the two main players uh, in Rice and Poindexter. And uh, I think we did the right thing at the time because the Black Panther Party, or whatever, by whatever name it was going by at the time of the uh, of the murder, completely disappeared from the city of Omaha. Everybody disassociated itself from the Black Panther Party or their uh, new names, and uh, it's sort of been the end of that sort of thing in the city of Omaha, and that's uh, 21 years ago. After the imprisonment of so many of its leaders, the Black Panthers were effectively crushed as a political force in America. COINTELPRO, the FBI's counterintelligence program which helped destroy the Panthers, came to an end with the resignation of President Nixon. But almost 20 years on, its victims remain in jail. I think that uh, Nixon, <clears throat> Hoover, and that whole, that whole gang were uh, judged to be criminals, and it was very clear uh, that they uh, participated in uh, quite a bit of criminal activity. They were, in fact, criminals. But what people failed to do was to follow through on not just saying, okay, he's a criminal, he did the wrong, 
and leave it at that. You have to go and look at the crimes that they committed and then um, um, clean it up, so to speak, uh, resolve the, you know, the problems that they had uh, begun. And that, that has not been done, and not only in my case, but in quite a few cases. Now, I'm just a regular guy like everybody, you know, like most other guys are. And anybody with, with normal human emotions and feelings who would go through that type of thing would be bitter. In fact, if they weren't bitter, something would be wrong with them, you know. Something would be wrong upstairs if they weren't bitter, disappointed, angry. And I was at the time, um, especially in my first uh, two or three years in prison, uh, very much. But, you know, eventually you have to, uh, you have to uh, settle down and, you know, and realize that, hey, I, I'm here, I'm going to be here while, why not just try to make something good out of this time and, and learn and grow from the experience and come out a better person. So I don't regret anything I've done. And yeah, I, I paid a high price, um, but in a way you make your bed and you have to, to you know, to lie in it. Uh, if you talk bad about people who have things to hide, you know they're going to try to get you. and. You have to be prepared for that. I mean, I talk about it now like it's, you know, a fair to care. Like I'm, I, I don't know, I, I speak of it, maybe I'm sounding like uh, it's no big thing. It obviously is a big thing. But, you know, but what, what can, you know, what can you do? You, you, you make certain choices, man. And, and depending on the kind of society that you live in, you know, they make you pay a price. So when I first came down here, I, I just kind of saw myself as a casualty of, of my own failure to to understand properly the, the seriousness of stuff. But after after a time, yeah, you know, I've said to myself a bunch of times, man, folks, you know, step forward, let me go, damn it. Despite the obvious injustice of their imprisonment, David Rice, Edward Poindexter, and Geronimo Pratt have little chance of being released. Without a change of political will, they seem destined to remain in jail, living witnesses to the fallibility of America's system of justice.